Hello, everyone, and welcome to Giga Metals Live Investment Summit today, hosted by Six. I'm Romeo, and I'm joined today by the company's CEO, Mark Jarvis. Today, Mark will very briefly discuss progress made in 2023, uh, and then we'll cover some of the questions that were pre-submitted over email, uh, and then throw it to live questions from the chat. Now, you can submit your questions using the Q&A panel at any time. Uh, it's on the right-hand side of your screen towards the bottom. As always, the summit is being recorded and will be available to watch afterwards on Six.com. Now, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Mark to kick things off and just chat about progress in 2023. Well, thank you very much, Romeo. So, so yeah, it's been an interesting year on many fronts. Um, you know, we completed our PFS, which was a very important milestone for us. We have significantly de-risked the project, and we've got it described in much more detail um, with a much higher level of confidence. Um, and, you know, we have also uh, solidified, I would have to say, our, our relationship with Mitsubishi Corp. Working with them, we've got to know each other very well, and it has become ever more apparent uh, how valuable it is to have them as our partner. They are really, uh, they, they like this project, they like us. <laughs> thankfully, and uh, and they would really like to see this thing get built. Um, now, something else that's happened this year is the price of nickel has gone down by 50% from six months ago. It's plummeted. Um, so, you know, quite frankly, we put out uh, a pre-feasibility report with a base case price for nickel of $9.75 a pound which we thought was conservative because that is 19% below the 20 year average price of nickel uh, in 2023 dollars. But no sooner did we put it out and the price of nickel plunged and it's currently, you know, plus or minus $8 a pound. So that has, uh, you know, given us some headwinds and created challenges for us. It's certainly not going to stop us uh, because you know, we think the uh, oversupply that was built in Indonesia, uh, largely by the Chinese, but, you know, demand just keeps growing and demand will catch up with that uh, uh, temporary oversupply in a year or so, we think. Um, so, uh, and the people that we're talking to are more concerned about the nickel price five years, 10 years, 20 years from now than about the price today. However, it does affect the psychology and it has hurt our stock price. So uh, that's just a reality. Uh, anyways, uh, that's that's kind of the broad strokes and uh, I think I'll open it up for questions. Yeah, I appreciate that summary, Mark. So like I said, uh, we got some questions that came in over email in advance. Uh, we'll run through those and then handle any questions that come in live. Uh, but the first question, um, this is from Craig. Uh, yes, the PFS indicates a low carbon operation with a carbon intensity of less than 1.8 tons of CO2 per ton of nickel and concentrate. You'd like to know what technologies and practices are being implemented to achieve this. Well, you know, the big thing is we're uh, we're uh, planning to get our power from the BC Hydro grid. So, you know, it's hydropower, which is low carbon in the first place, it's 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 a lot more uh, uh, light in carbon than say burning coal for your power, uh, you know, to go to the other extreme. Uh, but we're also, we've reduced our carbon footprint uh, uh, from the PEA by going to trolley assist. So we're still looking at a diesel mining fleet, but by using trolley assist, you're burning less diesel. Um, and it's more efficient as well. So we've actually uh, increased the internal rate of return by doing that. Um, in the future, uh, another big factor is going to be a fully electric mining fleet. And that doesn't exist today, but they uh, it's, it's coming. We can see it coming. We're not going to model it in an engineering report until it's actually here. Uh, but that will be uh, very helpful. And then the, you know, the other element is that we've got uh, silicate tailings, and um, 
And our tailings dam is, is designed to maximize the exposure of the silicate tailings to the atmosphere because these tailings will absorb CO2 from the atmosphere. So this isn't like carbon capture and storage where if it's stored somewhere, it could escape. No, this is, it actually converts into a mineral. The silicate mineral becomes a carbonate mineral um, and you can measure it. We're working with a scientist at the University of British Columbia who spent 20 years, uh, you know, working working with this phenomenon and developing methodologies to measure it. We're, we're hoping to get those methodologies uh, certified so that we could actually claim carbon credits for it. But we're just taking it one step at a time. We're not making any outrageous claims about this yet because there's work to do. And uh, But it is a real phenomenon. Um, and the other thing that the CO2 sequestration does to the silicate sands is it causes uh, a cementation. And so uh, in terms of a safe, secure tailings management facility, I don't think you can do better than this. I appreciate that. Uh, next, a question from Phil Montan. He asks, with a projected 30-year project life, how does GIGA plan to ensure the sustainability and environmental responsibility throughout the entirety of its operational lifespan? Well, by planning. I mean, um, you know, we've got a 30-year life plan, and we know what the water balance is each year, that sort of thing. So we know that the water balance is uh, neutral uh, with this project, which is perfect. Um, we, you know, we do have um, a water purification system that will be built in year one, but that would be there only for like amazing, you know, you know, amazingly rainy years, um, unusually rainy years is, is the only thing that could turn the water balance uh, positive. But everything is being designed, uh, you know, for the end game, which is, you know, clean it up and you know make it make it make it nice again now we talk about a 30-year mine life um i just want to mention that we think we've drilled volumetrically about 20 percent of of what we think is prospective we think there's more here um you know we've got almost a billion tons of reserves that's a pretty good start a uh, 30 year mine life is a pretty good start drilling is expensive but you know as you know if you build this mine and as you're building it out of cash flow you're going to keep drilling you're going to keep stepping out and we think 30 years is is a start um you know impossible to say where it ends up but we just know that there's more of this stuff we've got drill holes three kilometers from from our reserves that are very similar to what's inside the reserves. So, you know, there's more there. We we uh, have to define it. But, uh, you know, you use the word sustainability. It's, you know, it's sort of funny to use the word sustainability in terms of mining because you've got, you know, uh, a limited supply. And then once the mine's over, it's over. Um, it's just more sustainable the longer the mine life is. And this is going to be a multi-generation mine, we think. Well, that's great. Thank you. Uh, Jay Hinkle asks, this is a, a fairly technical question, but he asks, uh, the PFS mentions use of centerline and downstream tailings dams for tailings management. He's looking to know if there's uh, technology or measures that you use to mitigate the risks associating with potential failures uh, from tailings dams. Okay, so I'll preface that by saying I'm not an engineer. Um, what the engineers tell me is that uh, this method of construction that we've modeled in our PFS is the most expensive method <laughs> for one thing. Um, and, and it's the safest. It uses the most material in the dam. Um, so this, everything is designed for safety. Um, but also because of the water balance, we're not looking at, you know, well, partly because of the water balance, we're not looking at a dam holding back, you know, a bunch of water. Um, if you look at our um, slide deck uh, on our website and you look at the tailings management facility, uh, you know, plan view, 
uh, what's in the tailings management facility is mostly sand. We've got a small pond of water in the middle of it. So we don't have water right up to the edge of the dam. Um, there's, there's also very low seismic risk in this area. We're not in a seismically active area. So, you know, it just, it's, it's, it's designed for safety. We have to do it that way. I, you know, we think, um, because you have to get this permitted and, uh, and, you know, part of getting the permits is, you know, uh, talking to the first nations about what's going to be the effect on the river and particularly the Cascadena who are downstream of us, you know, their main concerns will be about, you know, how can you how you know, how can you show me how you're protecting the Turnigan river? And that's largely about the tailings management facility. So, you know, the safest construction that there is, it is also the most expensive or amongst the most expensive. Um, but it's worth it because we just want to get the risk as close to zero as it's possible to get. That makes sense. Thank you. Uh, the next one, it's a combination of a few questions that came in. So I've kind of grouped them together. Uh, and hopefully for everybody watching who submitted these questions, it, it broadly tackles what you're hoping to get to. Uh, but basically, the question is some variation of what major event is likely to change the share price uh, within the next two years? Um, okay, well, uh, given that the nickel price is down, um, maybe the nickel price moves up, that would help. Um, but that's out of my control. Uh, what's more in my control is um, we are actively seeking uh, a new <clears throat> a new partner to come in with fresh capital to move this project along. And we're looking to raise that money by selling a piece of the project rather than the company. We, we you know, with our stock price the way it is, it makes zero sense to sell stock to raise money. Um, and, you know, if you're looking at it at the project level, I mean, our project valuation is uh, what the base case, I think it's about uh, 570 million US dollars. Um, you know, <clears throat> I would much rather be, um, you know, negotiating on a number relative to that. So you know, that's what we're working on. Uh, we're not getting any pushback, really. Um, you know, some of the mining companies look at our market cap and they go, well, God, I can just take you over. And, you know, and I say, no, you can't. <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of the discussion. Um, and, uh, uh, but, but the OEMs, the car companies, uh, you know, so far in my experience, they don't even think that way. We're, we're just talking about project valuations and, you know, and the structure of how they get involved. So, um, and Mitsubishi is being, you know, and this is once again, the strength of dealing with a company like Mitsubishi, they are very eager to get another partner in, and they are been very active in terms of introducing us to other large companies that have a need for the material. Um, and so when, in, you know, when Mitsubishi introduces us to someone, we're coming in at quite a high level within the organization, as opposed to, if, you know, little mining junior, you know, maybe, you know, gets the janitor to talk to them, you know, it, it, it's, it's just, they are such good partners. I can't emphasize that enough. That's great. It's always useful to have a good good partner in tow. So, 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 but but I just realized I didn't answer them. If we get a deal on anything like the terms we're discussing, that would be a major event that I think would be a catalyst for uh, taking the stock price higher because the deal would be done on terms that imply a value for our company, which is much higher than where we're trading today. Oh, that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, now, I know the number of questions are coming live. We're almost through the, the bank questions, so just hold on a few minutes. We'll be able to, to tackle those. Uh, there's one question that came in from uh, Jean-Sebastien uh, that mentions that Lyle, Lyle Tritton of Giga Metals, uh, talked about the potential for sequestration of CO2 uh, through uh, activity in the tailings facility. He's wondering if there are plans to possibly monetize this carbon sequestration in the future. 
Right, and 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 to do that, the answer is yes. And to do that, it's uh, you need a government to certify your methodology for measuring how much CO2 gets absorbed by your tailings pile. And we are working on that, and Dr. Greg Dipple is working on that as well. So, you know, one step at a time, but we know that this is happening. You can see, you know, when you do the test work, you can see the sand go through a process of cementation. You, you can analyze the mineralogy afterwards, and yes, yeah, turned into a carbonate. So, so we know that this is happening. Um, it's just a question of how do you measure how much and, you know, can you get that methodology certified by a government? That makes sense. Uh, there's one question, just uh, reading the, the live questions, there's one directly related to your last answer, so I just wanted to get to that. One of those tough questions to answer, but Rob Moyer asks, how close are we to that potential deal um, with a strategic that you described as a catalyst? Boy, that's hard to say. I know. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, um, we're dealing typically with extremely large companies, and they don't move quickly. Um, it is helpful that Mitsubishi is already involved because uh, you know everybody knows that Mitsubishi knows mining, and so their due diligence, and you know, they brought in a very conservative outside engineering group to help them with their due diligence. We've continued to work with that outside engineering group uh, as we went through the PFS process. We had monthly meetings with them in Mitsubishi, and um, you know they're, you know, in a sense, looking over our shoulder as we do this. But 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 more than that, they were. Um, it turned into a really good collaboration. They were coming up with ideas. So, you know, I guess what I'm getting at is Mitsubishi's involvement tell some of these large companies that maybe we don't understand the mining business very well, but Mitsubishi's done their due diligence and that's meaningful to us. So that could speed up the process. I can tell you that there is a real appetite and in some cases what I would uh, uh, call an aggressive um, attitude. Uh, you know, some of the people we're talking to don't seem to get, you know, and especially with nickel prices down, they go, oh, well, this is no problem. Well, yeah, let's fast forward five years. There's going to be a problem in five years. Uh, it'll, it'll be harder to get material. And anybody that knows the market and can understand what's happening with the EV demand uh, and the battery demand for nickel um, knows that's true. So, you know, it, is it happening tomorrow? Doubtful. Um, could it happen in the first quarter of next year? Possible, but I'm certainly not making any guarantees about that. No, makes sense. The, that looming supply gap is uh, is around the corner. Uh, there's a question from uh, Nicole four five six. Um, she's curious how Giga Metals anticipates navigating the volatility of nickel prices and how you're planning to secure long-term offtake agreements. Well, there's nothing you can do about the volatility of nickel prices. It's just the nature of the beast. And the volatility, by the way, works both ways. Every once in a while, every 20 to 25 years or so, nickel goes crazy and it goes up to, well, in 2023 dollars, it goes up to 40, 45 dollars a pound. And so, you know, in, in terms of navigating it, when, when you're a nickel producer, um, you know, you get these long periods where the nickel price isn't exciting. It just kind of goes steady and you make decent money with your mind. But if you can be sitting there in production when nickel goes through one of those periodic spikes, you just make incredible profits for two or three years. It's just incredible profits. And that's kind of the nature of the business. You know, um, we have to think long term. If you're looking at building a mine, you can't look at the short term uh, trading in the price of nickel. And by the way, um, nickel prices currently uh, Jim Lennon at Macquarie uh, just came out with a report that, you know, about half of nickel producers in the world right now uh, are losing money at these prices. Their operating costs have gone up due to inflation and nickel prices come down. And so they're actually underwater. 
So prices this low, they can't sustain this lower. People will, you know, you, you can't afford to lose money forever. Um, offtake is something that uh, we're not, you know, really seriously looking at. I mean, people talk about offtake, but offtake is actually an impediment to getting the mine built. I could, you know, I've, I've, we've talked to OEMs, we've talked to car makers that say, well, we want offtake. And I say, fine, we can give you an offtake contract and here's a term sheet in fact, um, but there has to be an exit to it because the reality is whoever is going to come with the 1.9 billion to build this mine isn't going to want to see an offtake agreement in place. They want all the offtake to help them pay down their debt um, from, from, from building the mine. So it's a catch 22 where great, you've got an offtake agreement, but you've just reduced the possibility of the mine getting built. So, you know, uh, we're not, you know, we're not encouraging uh, off offtake discussions. A lot of the car makers are kind of stuck with that model, but some of the car makers have moved beyond it, and we're really encouraging looking at Mitsubishi's model, which is you become a partner, you stick with the project, you help get it built, and then you've got. If you're 10% or if you're 20%, you've got 10 or 20% of the offtake for the entire life of mine. Um, and you've got it at the cost of production. So you know what your costs are going to be for a long, long time. Um, that's the model that will get the mine built. Great to have an offtake, except if the mine doesn't get built, you got nothing. And not, nothing's nothing, right? <laughs> Um, there's a, a rep from Raymond James sent an email asking if you could comment on the infrastructure requirements for turn again, that really specifically the proposed upgrades to the access road and extension of the hydroelectric transmission line. Yeah, wires and roads. So <clears throat> uh, the, the all of those costs are in, you know, in our model currently in the PFS, we are paying for that in that model. Now, we think that the there's a lot of motivation from government to help with the infrastructure. And in fact, the Canadian government has a $1.5 billion uh, infrastructure fund uh, specifically to help uh, with critical minerals development. And what's that money for? The minister himself put it best, wires and roads. And uh, that's what we need. And if 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 we could get that paid for by the government, if the infrastructure could be put in by them, well, a couple of things. Obviously, it improves our economics. It's a pretty major chunk uh, out of our capex. It's I'm going to say it's maybe fifteen percent of our capex, twelve or fifteen percent. So significant and. That just is uh, a huge improvement in the economics for us if, if the infrastructure gets paid for. But more than that, it would send a signal to the international community that Canada really is open for business when it comes to critical minerals. That makes sense. Uh, last question before we jump into the questions live. I see there's a number that have uh, built up for anybody, especially those who joined late. Um, the bottom right of your screen, you can enter in the chat uh, questions. We can ask Mark while I've got this time. Uh, but the last question was sent in advance from Rob Pylon. Uh, he asked, what's the timeline for a feasibility study and will you do it while nickel prices are depressed? Well, it all depends on money. Um, so you know, that's, that's very much related to the conversations we're having with strategics. We're not going to launch on a full feasibility study until we're funded to do it. Um, now we're looking at, you know, and, 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 and frankly, we're, so we're looking for $50 million. I mean, in the uh, PFS, uh, the, the uh, engineers estimate it would cost 43 million US to get from where we are to a final investment decision. And I'm going, okay, that's fine but we are in an inflationary environment. So I just round that up to 50 million and I think I'm right. Um, now we're also looking at other uh, possibilities for advancing the project. What if, what if we can raise 
20 million and we can't raise 50 right now but 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 we're confident that we can raise more later with 20 million there are meaningful things we could do to advance this project uh, without launching into a full-scale feasibility so we wouldn't get there it would be slower to get there we might lose a year um, but we could uh, we could launch uh, the environmental assessment uh, process formally by submitting a project description. We've also got uh, more uh, metallurgical and geometallurgical work we'd like to do. We've had a very successful geometallurgy uh, program, and we've developed uh, extremely reliable um, uh, uh, metallurgy recovery algorithm which is at the heart of the cash flow, right? So, so if, your, if your recovery algorithm has very narrow error bars, as ours does, that gives you a lot more confidence in your cash flow model, which gives you a lot more confidence in, you know, in the economics of the project overall. So we will, we, we've got more work we'd like to do there that I think would be meaningful and would continue to de-risk the project. And there's other things as well. We'd like to do some road improvements um you know stuff like that we could do something meaningful if we got 20 million dollars in the door um i would rather get 50 million and and know that we're funded all the way to final investment decision that we're unstoppable stoppable is good uh so that's uh that wraps the um emailed in questions so i'm jumping into the questions from the live audience uh we'll run through as many as we can during this period uh the uh, first, from from Rob Moyer, asks a simple phrase but hard to answer question sometimes. But he wants to know what market cap do you think is a realistic number for Giga Metals? <laughs> That's a loaded question, isn't it? Um, I you know I think I think we would be in my view. I think we'd be fairly priced at ten times our current market cap. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Steve St. Jean asks, uh, and you know, we can take this in, in a bunch of directions. We asked how long is permitting in BC and wants to know if that has any chance to slow down the project beyond your estimates. Uh, yes, it's, it's, it's it, with permitting, nothing is zero risk. Now, um, you know, people are talking about the federal government is talking about trying to get to a two year timeline in permitting. I don't think it's ever been done in Canada, not for a major project. So we think three years uh, is realistic, and 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 partly because we don't see any uh, showstoppers environmentally with this project. Uh, due to the nature of the deposit, you're not going to see acid rock drainage um, from this because, again, the silicate tailings pile that's basic rocks and so any sulfides that are left sulfides are acid generating but but we're going to get as much of it out as we can because that's where the nickel and the and the cobalt are is in the is in the uh, pentlandite any sulfides that are left in the tailings are surrounded by basic rocks so it's self-neutralizing you know it's it's it shouldn't be tough we also we've been collecting data for a long time um, and so in terms of, you know, caribou movements, bears, wolves, um, you know, raptors, all that sort of thing. Yeah, we're going to make a great big hole in the ground. It's a big open pit mine. But this is, you know, there's lots of ways for migratory animals to root around this. You know, it's it's you you can't build a mine without having an impact. Uh, but the question is, is the impact acceptable? And this project looks like it is. Okay. Uh, Steve, hope that answered your question. If you have any follow-ups, do let us know. Um, M. Bebe asks, uh, why doesn't Mitsubishi fund the whole project? Does they already have a 15% stake in Giga Metals? They don't have any stake in Giga Metals. They've got a 15% stake in Hard Creek Nickel, which is the joint venture company. Um, that's not what Mitsubishi does they don't want to operate a mine they want to bring in a major mining company to operate the mine and we're talking to several major mining companies uh 
thanks to Mitsubishi. Um, that's their model. They're, they don't want to be in the mining business per se. They don't want to be in the mine operating business. They want to have a competent operator and they want to own a minority interest and then get as much of the offtake, you know, their minority interest gives them offtake automatically. Uh, they would love to get more offtake beyond that. So that's it. Mitsubishi is uh, very conservative. Yeah, no, fair enough. Um, Richard from uh, Newfoundland asks, and I'm, I apologize if I don't get this question, Richard. If, if I don't phrase it correctly, please let me know in the chat. Uh, but he wants to know if we have the possibility of Giga using converted moving equipment to hydrogen. Not sure if you know exactly what that means. Um, you know, I, I personally, uh, from everything I've read, and I don't pretend to be an expert, but I'm not, I'm skeptical on the whole hydrogen thing. Uh, myself, I think it's far more likely that we're going to have, uh, you know, the big mining trucks and stuff run by batteries. They'll 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 be electric, um, and that'll be great. I I just hydrogen. Yeah, I'm just a skeptic, so you know maybe I'm wrong. Richard Richard clarified in the chat. He means diesel to hydrogen. Not sure if that changes your answer. Again, uh, hydrogen. <laughs> yeah. No, oh, fair enough. I'm skeptical. Uh, P.T. Harris asks, are you worried about strategic partners coming in now with the market cap depressed? Well, you know, I have to tell you, if 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 you if you want to take a serious look at our project and you want to get in our data room and get behind, get into all of the data, and there's so much data behind, like like the engineering study is sort of like a summary. So you can read that as a public document, but if you want to get at the data and really, really, you know, test the assumptions and all of that, uh, you have to sign an NDA with us. And part of an NDA, uh, you know, critical part of an NDA is a standstill on buying stock. You can't, if you're in our data room, you can't buy stock without our permission. And that's how we prevent a creeping takeover. You know, ultimately, you know, there's a good likelihood that this company will be taken over. I just don't want to give it away. So, you know, I'm willing to be patient and I want to get the best price possible for the shareholders. Great. Um, the same uh, person asked another question. Are you looking for partnerships right now with other automakers or is Mitsubishi introducing you to more traditional strategics? Both. We're, we're, we're talking to mining companies and we're talking to auto companies. And some of the auto companies are getting quite aggressive now. And I think they should be. Uh, you know, something interesting is that the battery companies seem to be more conservative. It's, it's We've had lots of conversations with battery companies. And as I sit here today, unless something changes, it's, it's I would say it's doubtful that battery companies are going to invest upstream uh, in a mining project uh, like this. So, um but the automakers, it's a different story. They, they, you know, if you're going to be in the EV business 10 years from now, you better have critical mineral supplies locked up. And the best way to do it, frankly, is to be a minority partner in an operating line. Oh, great. Uh, now, oh, sorry, it looks like one more um, from also Rob Moyer. Uh, however, could Mitsubishi block any potential JV deals? Well, you know, part of our discussion when we um, when we had uh, you know, when when we were negotiating their entry into this joint venture agreement is who would we welcome as another partner and who wouldn't we welcome? And we I'm not going to get into the details of that, obviously, but um, you know, we we have an understanding about which companies. Uh, Mitsubishi is open to, and which companies uh, they're not, and um, you know, so that's already established. Uh, it, you know, if 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 we were inviting a company in that is that we've already agreed is is you know on the list, or from countries, there's actually countries as well that they don't want to be involved with. Um, <clears throat> you know, but if it's on the list, uh, they wouldn't block it. 
they couldn't block it and they wouldn't block it even if they could it's they don't operate that way they're very honorable um their word means something and so yeah no oh, that's clear um one thing i always like to ask at these kind of events just to wrap up is what you're most excited for in 2024 at uh, turn again with giga broadly well it's getting that partner that's our entire focus um now you know i am doing work to try and spread awareness about our company and hopefully get our stock price higher uh, that is also a concern to me as well i'm spending time on that and effort um but really the big thing is let's let's get that strategic in and let's get it on terms at least close to what we want oh great uh, I think that's all the questions that we have today. I'd really like to thank Mark for uh, taking us through this, this Q&A. And for everybody attending, particularly those who ask questions, uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, one thing, if you're like me and you think of the perfect question seconds after we close off, like I usually do, uh, please do reach out and we'll make sure that the, the Giga team gets back to you. Uh, but uh, if you want more information, you can always find it at gigametals.com. Uh, but that's it for me. I'll hand it back to Mark for a final word before closing off today. Well, thanks, Romeo. I just want to thank everyone for attending, and you know, thank you for your interest. I enjoy doing this. So I, you know, I like getting uh, the information out there, and uh, uh, also uh, feel free to contact us uh, if you've got any more questions. We're happy to answer them. Thanks, Mark. It's great to talk to you today, and thanks everybody for joining. <laughs>